And once again, we jump from clear conditions to drizzly, dreary weather. We got a warm front just south of us. And we'll take a look at that on the surface map and there it is. That warm front is located from Austin to the Gulf Coast and a cold front extending westward into northern Mexico. We have an axis of high pressure extending from California to Quebec. South of that axis we have a northerly component to the winds and temperatures below normal for this time of year. North of that axis we have a southwesterly component to the winds and temperatures fairly mild. And then if we take things all the way north into Canada, that Arctic air is in place from Victoria Island down to southwest Nunavut, and the coldest readings I'm seeing, minus 38 at that station right there. We also have ridging coming down from the Beaufort Sea into the Mackenzie River Plain, and there it is. That's high pressure, and associated with that, temperatures down to minus 20 at a lot of stations. Sure would hate to be at this station, minus 22 with a 30 knot wind out of the north. Now, notice that I'm not really talking about wind chills. I really hate wind chills because I think they are deceptive. The news media uses those values all the time to exaggerate, and I think that's really a bad way of doing it. On my show, we only deal with absolute values of temperature. I will never refer to windshield values because it's going to mislead you and give you a misleading idea of what these air masses are doing. All right, let's take a look at things in terms of air masses. We're looking at the 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness and pressure. Now, I know this chart is kind of messy, Sometimes we have to get in there and deal with uncomfortable, messy charts like this, but we will actually get a lot out of this. Now, let's take a look at the situation. Off the Atlantic coast, we've got this cold front right there. You can see the warm front and north of there, area of warm air advection, and behind it, large area of cold air advection. Then we have the Sparrow Clinic High over Ontario, and we've got that cold air advection to the east of that, and on the other side, warm air advection coming up from the north. Now notice that we've got two bands of temperature gradients. One down there in Texas, which is supporting the system that's down in that area. And we've got a northern band, which is associated with some thermal energy up in Canada. Now on the surface map, I did find a closed low right there. So I broke it up into a cold front and a warm front, and that could be an Alberta clipper, which is going to be moving east or southeast down that boundary. If that closed low was not there, I might be looking at a warm front moving northward. So we can take a quick look what's going to happen there in Alberta. Cyclogenesis. So it looks like that will carry it southeastward as a small Alberta clipper and eventually that ends up in the Hudson Bay region and then we see more development out there in Alberta towards the end of the week. Now we do need to focus on that system in Texas because that's going to have some major impacts on the northeastern US. So let's go ahead and zoom in. So even though the graphics are not identifying that closed low there it is right there in Texas, and then the frontal feature is running about like that. So this system is going to pick up on this thermal boundary, and we see that shifting eastward into Louisiana and Mississippi overnight. So here's what these systems are going to be looking like for tomorrow. Kind of a complex pattern there, two lows, one around Florida and another around South, South Carolina. That's going to be rapidly increasing strength moving up the coast into Delaware and Maryland later tomorrow. And you can see we're developing a large area of snow as that warm conveyor belt and cold conveyor belt begins developing. And then we see the system moving up into New England Wednesday night into Thursday. And this has the potential to drop quite a lot of snow over that area. 
and let's take a quick look at GFS accumulated snowfall using the 10 to 1 ratio. We can see a corridor developing from around Roanoke, Virginia, northeastward to just north of Washington, D.C. and into the New York City area. So total amounts, there they are. Looks like a lot of 12 to 16 inch amounts. Looks like Philadelphia will be on the edge of that, as will Washington, D.C. Places like Harrisburg, Binghamton, Albany, northern New Jersey, they're going to get the brunt of this system here. Let's check out the European model and look at the differences. Now again, we're using the 10 to 1 ratio. We see the track developing out around Roanoke and moving up the east coast. And yeah, this rain-snow line is pretty much similar to the GFS. So New York City definitely getting hammered there, whereas Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., Baltimore are more on the line. And we'll also be dealing with some high winds as this system moves up the coast. You can see there Thursday morning, 35 knots sustained, pretty common around Long Island. 35 knots sustained also during the midday hour, and then things should start tapering off towards Thursday evening. And then Friday morning as the cold sets in, this white here indicates upper teens, and the pink colors are getting down into the lower teens and single digits. So plenty of cold air in behind this system. Okay, I think this is a great time to look at the sounding profiles. We're going to focus on New York City, and that's located right there. So remember what we see here, we're looking at a deep low moving up the coast. So this is how things look tomorrow morning around dawn. So things are starting to deteriorate. And we're going to start looking at that sounding around midday. Now you can see here we've got northeasterly flow. It's likely overcast and we're starting to see maybe some light snow developing. And then as the day goes on we get some heavier snow. And then for Wednesday evening things really pick up. Some heavy snow intensities being indicated. And then the snow starts tapering off, the winds become more northerly, and we get the cold air advection wrapping around the back side. So let's run that back and see how the soundings change over time, starting at midday. Okay, so there it is, New York City. So say that you're hanging out there at your apartment on the 50th floor on West 57th or something like that. You're looking out the window and obviously, yeah, it's overcast. This whole layer right here is saturated. So 10,000 foot bases, very dense. That's likely going to be alto stratus and nimbo stratus. And down below it, we see kind of a cold, moderately dry layer. Now, what's interesting here is the winds are out of the east, so we're not quite looking at a blustery northerly wind or anything like that, but it is cold. And you can see the zero line here. Anything to the left of that with the red line is going to be sub-freezing. So, yeah, we do have a sub-freezing column. Very cold conditions. Now, can we get any precip out of this? Certainly. Yeah, this whole layer here can be raining and we can see on the omega plots here there's ascent and I would expect there probably is going to be Virga coming out of the stuff kind of a hazy kind of blurry looking cloud base very likely the sky would look something like this this is an example from Oklahoma from a photo that I took several years ago but it's in a very similar situation and the precipitation type is obviously going to be snow. There's no warm rain processes going on here. There could be super cool drops in there. However, very likely this is going to be supporting snow. Then as the hours go on, now it is evening and the whole column is saturated. 
So this is indicative of snow. We can see the top of the frontal layer right there. So it's about 12, 13,000 feet deep. Then around midnight, it's looking like this. The lower tip is starting to come up to 32 degrees. Then by dawn, it's still entirely below freezing. And then we see things shifting to the left gradually as the cold air advection sets in. So what if you're a little bit further south, say around Atlantic City? I don't know exactly where Atlantic City is. Okay, it's going to be right there, southeast of Philadelphia. So that's going to be right there. So if we run this forward, rain, heavy rain, and maybe a tiny bit of snow towards the very end. Okay, how does that unfold? Well, here we are midday on Wednesday. There's the zero line, and with the column being below freezing, that's going to support snow. And we can see a very narrow area down near the surface of warm conditions. So there could be a little bit of snow maybe to start things off. But by evening, look at that, the zero line is right there. We've got maybe one kilometer of air that's above freezing. Now technically we do need to use the wet bulb temperature, but since it's saturated all the way up and down, that wet bulb is going to pretty closely follow the temperature line. Anyway, one kilometer of depth, that's probably going to melt anything falling through it. So very likely we're seeing snow here melting on the way down and giving us rain down on the lower levels. So by midnight, there's the zero line right there. Vast amount of warming. You can see tremendous upward motion. That's probably convection. And there's that southeasterly flow bringing warm temperatures up through there. So this is a very strong warm air advection pattern. You can see on the photograph there, wow, that's uh, quite a hook there. That's something we would see on the Great Plains maybe during severe weather season. Well, we're actually not going to get any supercells or anything like that out of this. But on the other hand, yeah, lots of precip development there, and it's all going to come down as rain. And with that much mixed phase precipitation in the cloud and the warm air advection, I would not be surprised to see thunder. And this is a very, very hazardous pattern for icing in the cloud, clear ice and that kind of thing. So it would be very hazardous to be flying in and out of here when we have a sounding like this. Let's check out what's happening during early Thursday. Now we're starting to get the cold air advection. The winds have turned out to the north there, and the photograph looks quite a bit different. However, it has dried out in the mid-levels, and we're starting to see some subsidence in the mid-levels. So the precip processes have gone away. So you may squeak out a little bit of snow grains or light snow or something like that out of this low stratocumulus. Yeah, and it kind of looks like maybe we hang on to a little bit of stratocumulus there through the day. And then just a quick check over there in Siberia to see how things are holding up. Yeah, it's cold. <laughs> However, yeah, a little low pressure system there around Bratsk down to just northwest of Irkutsk. That's heading into... I don't know if that's going to actually make it, you know, something like that to the, to the west that has the potential of kind of breaking up the inversions, but the inversion there is pretty deep. So this could end up kind of like riding over the dome of Arctic air. So what temperatures are we seeing? Looks like minus 61, looks slightly warmer than what we had yesterday. I know we were seeing a minus 60 around here somewhere. So it's warmed up a little bit, but still quite cold. And down to the south, the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Yeah, that runs up in a corridor from Khabarovsk up to, let's see, around the top of 
China and then over towards Irkutsk. So you can see even along those rails, minus 36. So some very, very cold conditions. And this is like northern China right there with minus 33. And I'm even seeing minus 40 there in northern China. Maybe we need to pan this map a little bit south and see what's going on. Yeah, I guess we need some special music for each part of the world. But anyway, yeah, there's China right there. We have Mongolia there and Russia up to the north. So those extreme temperatures, minus 40, that's right there in the northern part of Manchuria. But as we go south, the temperatures get to more sane levels above zero Fahrenheit. And around Beijing, I think that's Beijing right there, 23 degrees I, th I see a bit of a heat, urban heat island effect there. This is going to be about, let's see, zero, 18Z, that's going to be about 3 a.m. So yeah, that's an urban heat island effect there. 23 degrees at Beijing, and all around it, temperatures are in the teens. Anyway, yeah, I can see Seoul right there with 16. This is very cool air, but it's not particularly cold. And there's a look at the pressure lines. One thing that's interesting is that there's a lot of variability in the temperature in Mongolia, in the western part of the country. Some areas minus 25, some areas minus 8, and a few very, very heavily sheltered pockets minus 35 due to probably strong radiational cooling. And there's likely some layers of stratus and fog that are radiating some of that heat off in the space. And that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. Thank you for those who have supported the webcast. And for the rest of you, please subscribe and comment and like. Thank you, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.